uh, when doing interior. And I know there are lots of residents uh, that come on this, uh, on this, and, and 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 this is something you just have to really, really learn well. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the see-through anatomy. I, uh, I know you can use image guidance for skull bases and vascular. You don't really need it a lot, but it's, it's absolutely fine if you want to use it. Uh, but the see-through anatomy is important and you can't fully rely on it. So you have to really understand, uh, even in intrinsic tumors, you know, what the bony anatomy way will take you within the specific gyra. And I just want to highlight that sort of principle. Um, I've moved, I trained in a department where we did very, very tailored, very small craniotomies. I've moved a little bit away from that. I think when you're starting out, uh, it is absolutely fine to think about tailoring the skin incisions, drilling, drill opening holes, and you should. But definitely when you're starting out, particularly in acute pathology, you really want to consider a larger opening. So I think that's a sensible thing, a safe thing to do, particularly when you're starting out. Okay, uh, like everything in skull base, uh, the positioning is key. And you, I think you have to decide what you think is the optimal position. Uh, I've moved away from using retractors. I used to use retractors, so now I, I really focus on the positioning and the drilling. But there are certain key points you, you want to understand. And, and you have to understand what are the things that you can alter during the operation and what, can, what is fixed once you put the drapes on. So there's a lot of talk about head rotation. Uh, and you can use a 35 or 40 degree head rotation. It, it doesn't matter. I, I've worked with very senior surgeons who, who turn the head 90 degrees. I don't like that. I don't agree with that. I prefer sort of 30 degree, 45 degree rotation, but actually uh, it doesn't matter. With modern operating tables, that head rotation is, is irrelevant because you can now rotate the table. It's the same with uh, what you do for retrosigmoid craniotomies. The one thing I would say is when you're starting out, I would keep the head rotation exactly the same for most pathologies because it then puts the silver fissure in the same place if you're splitting the fissure and that makes it much easier when you're starting out. As you get a bit better, you can start to change the head rotation. So yes, it's important, but actually matters a little bit less. What does really matter is getting the male uppermost and getting extension. So you really want the frontal and triple lobes to fall back. So once you start dissecting the brain off the cranial nerves, off the skull base floor and draining CSF you start, or, or debulking tumor, you start to get more and more space. And that is very important. So that extension is very important. I also like this, a slight lift up in the head. I, I do that for both terrenal and retrosigmoid. It sort of brings the patient towards me. And as far as possible, you want the patient as close to you as possible. It doesn't matter how tall you are. I think that's important as well. So uh, head rotation, yes, it's important. Keep it, try and keep it the same but that's one thing you can adjust. The other things I've talked about, once the drape's gone, you, you can't be adjusting that. So that is important, okay? Uh, and then there's the incision. Um, again, again, it doesn't matter. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the nerve and the blood vessels and things like that. But, uh, but I like an incision close to the ear. I understand there's, there's a different preference, that's okay. Uh, I like it close or in a crease. Uh, the one important thing with incision is you should cross the midline with your skin incision. Uh, and I don't like skin incisions that sort of come towards the forehead because sometimes if you put skin retractors in and things, if it splits, you split the forehead, it's just unnecessary. So I like a skin incision that goes back towards the hairline uh, and it should cross the midline. And that, that usually gives you very nice access uh, going down low. Okay. The, the next thing is uh, what's gonna happen with the, with the blood vessels. So you've got two branches uh, of the superficial temporal artery. And I think, except in, in an ECIC bypass, uh, where you're on purpose gonna protect it, when you make your skin incision, and usually the skin incision will be slightly further back, you're always gonna take the anterior branch. And therefore it's important to understand what the blood supply of the scalp really is and what the blood supply of the temporalis muscle is. And I'll talk about that uh, and, and how you're gonna protect the blood supply, particularly to the temporalis muscle once you've lost this anterior branch. I don't think you have a lot of choice. In most incisions here, you, you'll lose that, that anterior branch. And that's just showing it again, uh, showing how normally the anterior branch uh, and the vein will be taken along in your skin incision. You'll still have the posterior branch and we'll talk a bit about the deep temporal artery and how that's important. Just to highlight this point again, uh, this is, this is important in, in, in all craniotomies, uh, but we're, we're really talking about elective cases here. Uh, in trauma, you really want uh, much larger incisions. You can go through the muscle, uh, that's all fine, cut straight down. You're not gonna worry about 
uh, fancy approaches to take you very low down to the zygoma uh, or even necessarily to the key point here. All right, so then we're gonna talk about the, the facial nerve. And, and the key with the facial nerve here is really understanding what the, the temporal branch does and protecting the temporal branch. Uh, as I said, we're wanting to take the skin flat forward. We want to get the temporalis muscle down and down and back if we can. And that really, it's important to understand what the temporal branch of the facial nerve does when you're gonna do that. Now this diagram is, uh, it's a very, very, very nice diagram uh, from the paper I showed earlier, uh, but it's slightly wrong. But I think it explains the, 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 the overall the point very well. So the fish, the uh, cause of the frontal branch should be the temporal branch uh, supplying frontalis, and really that should be here. Okay, but let's just go through go through the main points. You've got you've got skin, you've got zygoma, and you've got the temporalis muscle, and you have to understand that there is a a deep temporal fascia, and there is a superficial temporal fascia, and there are two fat pads. You can call it superficial and deep, or you can call it temporal and buccal. That doesn't matter. But the, you have to understand there are two layers to the fascia over the muscle, uh, and they can be split. You have a superficial fat pad and you have a deep fat pad. The temporal branch lies on the superficial temporal fascia. You can then do, and I'll show a video of an interfascial where you go between the superficial and deep fascia, and that allows you to take the temporal uh, branch of the facial nerve forward while taking the muscle down and back. Or what is sometimes easier is to, is to just drop down here and do a sub-fascial approach. So you take the fascia forward with the skin flap and the muscle goes down and back. The interfascial approach is anatomically nicer. Uh, it drops you nicely onto the zygoma. That's not a problem. If you go sub-fascial, you just have to cut through with this fat. You can use monopolar as very safe at that point. Uh, and cut back to zygoma, and that's absolutely fine. The closure is a bit nicer with the interfascial, but, but you can use either. Uh, and as I said, it drops you nicely if you were gonna take parts of the zygoma off. So coming back to that picture again, this is elective craniotomy work, not for, not for trauma cases where you've got to get in quickly. The whole point of a skull base or vascular approach terional is that you wanna take, you wanna get nice and low along the skull base. We don't wanna use retractors. We wanna, we wanna get the skin forward. We wanna get the muscle bulk away so we can look down this corridor. We want to drill away the bone. We're gonna drain CSF, debulk tumor, uh, and, and do a nice careful safe approach down here. And that is the whole point. And now we're gonna talk about some of that drilling, how you drill on the anterior fossa, how you drill the sphenoid down, how you get that skin flat forward, how you get the temporalis down. So this is just a video. Sorry, no, I'll come back to that later. Uh, I'm just going to show this again from another very nice, uh, very nice paper that goes through this layers of understanding the facial nerve. And if anybody wants this, can let me know. So you've got the superficial type of fascia with the facial nerve. Uh, you have your superficial fat pad. You've got your deep temporal fascia. Uh, and as I said, if you want, you can come subfascial through this one. And then you've got your deep temporal fat pad. It's very important to understand those layers. And then you've got temporalis. Okay, and then you've got this nice periosteum here that protects the nerve and blood supply to temporalis. And the facial nerve is on the superficial temporal fascia. I'm going to have a nice sort of subperiosteal sort of dissection to follow that. Okay, sorry, a couple more things to talk about before we look at the look at the video. I'm obsessed with the temporalis muscle because I think it's uh, it's really important and it's a it's a real cause of morbidity uh, in patients if you don't handle the temporalis muscle well. And in elective surgery, I really try uh, to minimize what I do with the monopolar. Uh, I think it's probably better that way. I know people would use it, but uh, you really want to minimize it. And these are some of the issues you can get if you don't protect the temporalis muscle. And now we're going to talk about uh, the origin and insertion of the muscles. Again, this is the temporal fossa, the terion is here. It's about looking down this window here. We want to get the muscle down and back. But first we have to really understand what is the nerve, blood supply, where does the muscle attach? 
And for a muscle that a lot of us cut through or go through, it's surprising how little <clears throat> we understand. Another great paper from Paolo Kadri and, and Al Mefti uh, showing the fact that it's got sort of three main uh, sort of three main bundles to it there. Uh, and this again is the temporalized muscle. We're going to look at some of these, these parts of it. But really, you want, when you really want to understand what the key points here are sort of the nerve and blood supply. Okay, so just a bit of basics for the residents. As you understand, it passes uh, between the skull and the zygoma. <clears throat> and you have these fibers that converge on the aponeurosis. Okay, and it inserts into two separate heads. And these are the these are the insertion points. And we're now looking at this insertion of the mandible. As you know, its main functions were chewing, and the important bits of anatomy to understand are the coronoid process and, and the anterior part of the ramus. Uh, and that's where that's where the muscle attaches. So you can see how you get a very strong chewing action from its attachment here. I think that's important to understand. Okay, so you can see that its origin inserting downwards. Uh, and then if you really want to delve deeper into it, you can start to look at the sort of uh, muscle fibers in, in more detail. I think that's important if you're if you're applying slightly more complex approaches, but but as starters, you know, for more basics, I think you have to be an understanding of the basic anatomy of the muscle. We all know uh, it's the sort of mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve and that sort of divides up. And again, I think uh, when you start working in this area more, it is useful to start to understand uh, what you can really what you can really get in terms of swinging these muscles and moving them around and what their nerve and blood supply is. Uh, but there are branches of the nerve that go on to supply the, the temporalis muscle. Now, understanding is blood supply is absolutely key to keeping the muscle safe. I said before that we would go through the anterior branch of the superficial temporal artery. So actually, a lot of the muscle bulk is then going to be supplied by the deep temporal artery. So it's the branches, it's the anterior and posterior branches of the deep temporal artery that are key. This is a branch uh, of the maxillary artery. And that's what's really supplying uh, blood uh, to the temporalis muscle and, and protecting the temporalis muscle. Okay, and you also have to understand that the anterior deep temporal artery uh, anastomosis with perforating branches from the middle meningeal artery. That's another important point uh, to notice when you're doing this and why you'll get bleeding anteriorly, but you don't at the back of the muscle. I'll talk a bit about that anastomosis there. So coming back again to this picture, this is about protecting the nerve and blood supply. You can use monopolar. I think the video I showed, I do use a bit of monopolar, but where possible, I would switch to sharp periostal dissection. I think now I've gone more, almost completely to sharp periostal dissection uh, to protect the muscle. Uh, this is really for preserving and protecting STA, usually if we're doing an ECIC bypass, something like that. Okay, back to, the, back to this again. This is the view you're going to get. I just wanna talk about the deep temporal artery again. Uh, the deep temporal artery will be coming up here. As, as, you're, as you're going down, it's, it's very important not to go with monopolar. The anastomosis between the deep temporal artery and minimum gel is here. So here you'll have a nice periosteal layer. It'll be very easy to, to, to take off subperistal dissection. Here you get an anastomosis. You have to, usually have to use monopolar. If you have a lateral sphenoid meningioma, it'll be very vascular, uh, in, usually in large ones in that area there. But as you as you go down here, it's it's uh, it's important. Sorry, it's important to understand that the deep temporal artery is coming up. As you start to see a little bit of fat here, it's analogous to the fat you see when you're doing a retro sigma, and you know to stop. You should stop. Okay. And so the deep temporal artery you want to protect it. It's coming up here. You can put a hook in usually at that point and feel the veroorbital fissure. At this point, if you're doing an optozygomatic and things as well. Uh, but this is an important place to protect the blood supply to the temporalis muscle. All right, so now we're going to talk about doing the terrial craniotomy. Uh, it doesn't matter how you do it. Uh, I've moved to sort of doing an L, little L, and then doing a craniotomy. We can do an L with burr holes. Uh, if we're training, usually we put, we put a few extra burr holes. Uh, you want to put more burr holes, you want to put one or two. It, it really doesn't matter. Uh, but what does matter is you must do this safely. You must lift the bone off safely. Don't injure. There's no need to do anything fancy and then get dural tears. Uh, you want a nice dural closure at the end, and that's important. Okay, um, this is a key point. You gotta take away bone to give you a nice safe access inside. All right. Uh, and and to taking that bone, you have to understand what the greater wing and lesser wing does and how you can drill right down to the lateral part of the superior orbital fissure. And that is important. And also what you'll be drilling along the anterior fossa floor. So 
Let's just go through the opening now uh, in a terional. This is a subfascial, sorry, an interfascial dissection. I think in the interest of time, I may skip forward. In an interfascial, uh, you're making the incision here above the zygoma. In a subfascial, it doesn't matter. You can cut absolutely anywhere you like. Just to orientate us, we're on the left-hand side. Um, frontal bone is here, zygoma is here. So we're just going now and separating out in the interfascial plane. The facial nerve is in the superficial temporal fascia and going forwards. You, have, you still have the deep temporal fascia there. Equally, you could have gone subfascial and just lifted this forward. The point of all of this is to take the skin flap and the nerve forward. We're gonna take the muscle down and back. And I think I'll just uh, skip forward a little bit. So we're starting to expose it using the, the monopolar here to expose a bit of the zygoma and that's, uh, that's okay. I think the less you use it, the better. Right, so you can see very nice, you know, nice plane here, we're lifting it off. Now I do something a little bit different to everybody else. I don't cut into the muscle at any point. It's absolutely okay to cut in the muscle. I find it's unnecessary. So I just start to disconnect along the sphenoid uh, and take it right down and back but it's absolutely okay to cut into if you want to, I don't. It's absolutely okay to leave a cuff here and suture it back, I don't. I suture it back onto the bone plates. You see at the back, we had a nice dissection here. It bleeds a little bit. That's because of the anastomosis between the middle meningeal and the deep temporal. You don't have the anastomosis at the back. So we'll bleed a little bit here. That's normal. You can use a bit of monopole if you want. So remember deep temporal artery is coming uh, from below and you wanna protect that. Good. So then you're gonna to start to make a little L-shaped drilling and that's enough to get in. And you can even start thinning your sphenoid at that point. I think this video, we put a few other uh, burr holes and that's absolutely okay. So I'm just gonna skip forward on that. Okay, so we had an L-shaped drilling and we did the craniotomy. Now, now there are a few important points here. You have this triangular sphenoid bone that is blocking your access down uh, towards the towards the deep areas where you want to get to the skull base and, and vascular pathology, we're getting into the proximal sylvan fissure, dropping onto optic nerve, all of those things. So this triangular bit of bone has to go. And you have to remember that you have to drill it flat. A lot of people will drill the deep bits. Uh, in fact, I'm not doing that here. Uh, but you have to drill superficial as well at the end because it has to be nice and flat as you reflect the dura forward. You also want to drill along the anterior fossa floor here. Uh, I'm just going to skip forward, skip forward. So you want to drill that nice and flat. I think it's probably a very drilled off part of the anterior fossil floor. Uh, and that gives you a, a beautiful view down so you can drop straight in uh, with the optic nerve. And this is just to show, uh, we've opened up spur of fissure. You can even put an upcut in there if you want. Meningo orbital band is here and you can start to open superior orbital fissure. Uh, you start to drill orbital tumors, you know, it's been optimal in tumors. You'll have a lot of hyperostosis. You can start to drill downwards depending on which direction you want to go. You want to get that nice and flat and you drill the fossa floor and then you can start to open the dura. Okay. And then once you get in, you have to really understand the microsurgery of the systems. I think still one of the best books on this is still from Yazgal, absolutely beautiful book, uh, talking about uh, the, the systems. And I said, you know, that's really important for clinoidal meningitis in particular for one type of them that's critical. And you have to understand some key relationships. Uh, as, you, as you drop in on the frontal side of the sylvan fissure, you're going to immediately get onto optic nerve and you have to understand the relationship to the carotid, how the carotid is lateral to optic nerve. If you have a bit of time, I can show how that can be confusing when you look to the opposite side, you get that very similar view when you look from, from one side to the other. Um, this, this area rarely uh, is splayed, but it can be. I, I have a case I can show of an epidermoid that splays it. The second important relationship is of the A1 and chiasm with the, the ACOM complex and A1 and the epsilateral optic nerve. Uh, this almost never splays, and this relationship is very important to understand as well as you're starting out and, and trying to work on, on this sort of anatomy. Again, it's just showing the chiasm, uh, and I think it's quite useful when you look at, I'll show some men in Germans, it's very useful to work out where the chiasm is. Uh, a good trick is rather than looking for the chiasm, it's actually just look for the ACOM complex. Uh, and it very rarely is this is the chiasm splayed from the ACOM. And you can always see the ACOM even on CT scans. And I've got some scans to show or MR. You can always see ACOM and that tells you where chiasm is. And that's important for planning your approaches to tuberculum and, and planar meningiomas. Now this is for 
So when you're starting out, as you as you drop in, uh, this is obviously an older one with the retractor now, we don't we wouldn't use that. Uh, but you have to start to understand where optic nerve is going to be, where carotid is going to be. So even before you start to open the arachnoid, you've got to start to understand roughly, you know, where these structures are going to be. And as you, as you progress uh, and, and start to open, you, you know, you start to expose more of that, you know, where optic nerve is going to be. So factory uh, A1 coming in and, and understanding all of that uh, is important. Okay. So Salman, am I okay? I think I'm overrunning a little bit. Can I show a little bit more, a couple of videos? Yeah, carry on, we're enjoying this, carry on. That's Fine. very kind. Okay, so just to show again, um, and, and, and I'm sure Sean you know, is very good and Scott, he said he, he, will, he will talk about this or maybe we can have some comments on this. Um, whether you go open or endoscopic, I don't think it matters. I think you must be able to do both and you have to really understand both and then you can advise patients the best way. Uh, and for me, one, one, and, and there's a lot more than just, you know, where the chiasm is, you start talking about prefix, postfix and all of that, but, but just for, in terms of basics, understanding where the chiasm is, is, is very, very useful. And even if you can't see the chiasm, if you can see the ACOM complex or where, where the vessels are going to be, you know the chiasm is going to be there. So actually coming endoscopically for this would be, would be very nice. Obviously, this is a talk about terional, so I'm going to show a terional video. Uh, for 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 approaching this, so this is uh, this is a left sorry a right side approach. Uh, you got frontal lobe, uh, temporal lobe. We just started splitting the fissure, and and you have to really understand how you're gonna what you're gonna see when you drop down. You know, uh, carotid. Usually you see uh, optic nerve, but you can see how the the drilling. There's no no retractors being used. Just from the drilling head position. It's, it's very comfortable, very easy, you know, very straightforward operating, isn't it? So we're just doing a little bit of a Sylvan Fisher split. It's actually the proximal Sylvan Fisher split that I really, that I really find useful. And then I'm gonna start, you know, skip forward here. And this is sort of view, you know, you get a very nice view, uh, optic nerve, you've got A1, A1 coming across the optic nerve, you know, tumor is going to be there, carotid is here, you've got a view of the carotid there. And this is just, you know, very basic, very standard skull base either with scissors or I like to use a bipolar sometimes, you have to, the very first thing you do is you disconnect the brain from the, from the cranial nerves, from the vessels. Uh, and here we're just disconnecting, tumors coming into view here. And the whole time you're draining CSF, draining CSF, the brain is just relaxing down nicely. So just take your time, uh, carefully open, carefully open, take the brain away uh, so you can start sort of moving it backwards and it gives you lots of space to start working on the tumor. And you're draining CSF the whole time. So as the operation keeps going, as you debug, so you drain CSF, it gets easier and easier. Uh, and then you, Vlad, Vlad loves the, uh, uh, the, you know, talking about the arachnoid. I think it's much better than me talking about it. But what you want to do is you want to start peeling back this arachnoid. You don't want to coagulate the arachnoid onto the tumor. I, uh, Majid Sami talks about using these jeweler's forceps. This is a little pause in the video just to show that you've got to really pick it up and drag it backwards. <clears throat> and that is key. Uh, I like to use the bipolars and sucker to do that. Uh, and then you're going to debulk, debulk. I think I'm overrunning, so I'm going to skip forward in the video. Uh, usually very nice planes in this area. You can separate tumor away uh, very nicely from the optic nerves. This is just uh, skipping towards the end. Most of the, the tumor is gone. Uh, I don't think I really got the time to talk about um, uh, opening the optic canals, but in, in all juxtacellular meningiomas, I would always open the canals, whether you come endoscopic or open, you must always open the canals. I think this video does show one thing quite nicely, and that also it's just we drill and then we're opening the canal. Uh, and that's just some of the final bits of the, the tumor section. Yeah, I think it just shows this quite nicely how you can see this is contralateral carotid, and, and, and you can see how some people get confused and drop that way. And if you really understand what you're doing, drop on ipsilateral optic nerve, uh, pick up the, the carotid uh, and, the, and, and the A1 and really understand that relationship very well. Nice view of the chiasm there. Uh, and, and you, know, you get a very, very nice resection in these tumors. And you can see the post-op scans, uh, which look good. You can see the chiasm there. Uh, this is just showing a slightly slightly different. So this is, you know, this is more planum uh, and this is optic nerve just being pushed. Well, you, you think you think tuberculum possibly, but actually the optic nerves are being, this is optic nerve here and you'll see in the video, uh, it's being pushed down and, and, and that's important. 
to understand where the optic nerves are in relationship to this. So same again, you know, we're dropping in. Uh, arachnoid has already been peeled back, only then would you start to coagulate onto the tumor. I'll just skip forward. Uh, debulking, debulking. Okay, that's actually the optic nerve there, plastered onto the tumor. It's actually, it was very, very adherent uh, onto the tumor, but that's fine. You know, there's no rush to go in and, and take it. You could, you could open the canal at this early point, actually, because you are manipulating on the optic nerve as you uh, as you work on this, so that's not unreasonable to do. I think I actually here yeah, I open it late, but and I just start to debulk the tumor. But one one thing you could do is to open optic canal early uh, in these cases, and I think that's quite helpful. Uh, it's one of the nice things about endoscopic, where you you know you, you decompress the canals, uh, or you can decompress the canals very early on. So you, so you can do the same thing in open surgery. You can you can decompress early on if you want to. But anyway. The key is to take your time, you're gonna drain CSF, no need for retractors, you've drilled the whole thing nicely, just really, really debulk, debulk, debulk. Keep debulking, I'm just taking tumor off, taking tumor off, I'm gonna skip forward here. Uh, working on the tumor, you can see that the nerve is there. Uh, and, and here we've sort of drilled a bit of the canal, I'm just sort of widening the opening a little bit here. And that's, in juxtaposition, and meningioma side, always, always open the canal, and it usually gives you a nice plane then to work forward, so you've got two areas. Uh, where you can work. I think in the interest of time, I will I'll skip forward. But, uh, but basically, you can really you can really work tumor off, really work it off the nerves here. I think I leave a small residual at the end. Uh, that's all tumor that came from from within the canal. So that always always has nice planes at that point there. But as you come further back, the plane can be more difficult, uh, and you can just gently gently work work tumor off. Uh, get very nice resection. Uh, you get a nice view, this tiny bit here that I didn't feel I could safely separate that I left. Uh, we get a beautiful view of the chiasm uh, at the end. So, you know, very, very nice approach. Uh, but equally, it can be done endoscopically and you get a nice uh, post op result. I'll just show this quickly, uh, just to show that in a, in a terional, depending on the pathology, this is actually an epidermoid. You can see it's coming back to the uh, uh, to the optic tracts. It also had a traumatic, it's a redo epidermal actually. Uh, and from the first operation a long time ago, they had a traumatic aneurysm uh, on it. But uh, just, just the view you can get, you know, we use the terminal go, as I said, posture clinoid, you can get all the way in the posture fossa, depending on the, on the pathology you're, you're dealing with. I think we've talked about all of these sorts of principles of, you know, opening and uh, so I'm just gonna skip forward. Uh, as you can see the traumatic aneurysm there, this is the carotid optic nerve. Uh, and this is one of the cases where you can see that this space here has been splayed. You've got A1, M1. A lot of the epidermoid has come out. Uh, but if I skip forward, and just, and just take, again, you know, just take your time, just keep opening, keep opening. Uh, you get a very nice view of the A1 there. But what I really want to show you is the optic track and, and how the epidermoid are basically splayed or, you know, going all the way here, it's splayed. Um, here we go. It's optic nerve. Uh, and then the tract uh, going backwards. So just a beautiful view, all of this epidemic came out. Uh, and obviously we, uh, uh, we, dealt with the, we dealt with the aneurysm. Uh, so one time I do sometimes put retractors in actually, if, a, if I'm gonna clip uh, an aneurysm. So you get a very nice uh, view in. And there's no rush. Uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not a quick surgeon. I, I really like to take my time with everything, uh, even with clipping, you know, especially with clipping, sorry. Uh, you just really want to take your time. And, you know, I'm never sort of racing against the clock for, for any operation. Okay. Uh, one last one. Uh, I'll skip all of the drilling. So sorry, this was a mesial temporal cavernoma. You can see how the motor pathways are coming close to it at the top. Uh, obviously, we would favor splitting the some fissure coming down to it. You don't want to go through brain. I will skip. So a lot of drilling. Uh, I do like to drill even in straightforward cases. Uh, and the principles are the same. I'm going to drop in. Uh, you can see there's some staining here from the cavernoma. Uh, but the principles are exactly the same. You're taking the brain off. We're going to take our time. We're going to drain CSF. We're gonna open the arachnoid slowly. We're gonna split the sylvan fissure. Uh, I'll just come to the, probably to the end of this operation just to show you the sort of quite beautiful anatomy uh, 
Uh, so you know, this third nerve there, uh, fetal PCOM. Uh, as Vlad pointed out last time, and I, I think he saw this video. Uh, but anyway, just take your time. We're going to mobilize the brain off nicely. That allows you to manipulate the brain and things with no danger at all. Uh, you're going in, you're looking at the gliotic plane, and you're going to, it's almost a nice gliotic plane to remove the cavernoma. But what I really want to show is the sort of view you can get uh, uh, towards the end. You just get an absolutely beautiful view. This is just a standard terrorial craniotomy. Uh, you can get a fantastic view looking all the way, you know, that third nerve going all the way uh, to the back to the brain stem. Uh, you, had a, you had a great view at the end of the carotid, the fetal, uh, sorry, um, uh, this is not a the picture, isn't as good actually. Come back a little bit just to show you um, the choroidals. Anyway, fantastic view of the PCOM, uh, P, PCOM choroidals, M1, A1, yeah, that's, that's a slightly better view. I'm sorry, I've skipped through the video because of time, but essentially this is the P2, the third nerve, uh, M1 here, fetal PCOM going back, as you can see the choroidal, uh, and went through, and you look around there and, and the carotid. Okay, so I think I've taken up uh, more than enough time. I really should hand over to my, uh, to my colleague. Uh, but the one thing I will say is, um, you know, there's been a lot of webinars and things going on, but I, you know, for all the residents, uh, I, I think of surgery a bit like swimming. This is swimming in the open water. Uh, you, you can talk about it, you can watch webinars. It's very helpful, it's very useful, but you must get stuck in. Uh, and then the things that you really learn that you can't teach on a webinar when the bleeding starts, when the access is difficult, and there's brain swelling and all of those sorts of things. So yes, these, these things are very good, they're very helpful, but you must really get in, stick in there, do a lot of operating, watch a lot of operating, even if you don't get a chance to do it, get involved as much as possible. And that is the real key to getting, getting better and get involved in, and do difficult cases. Uh, I think it's an African saying, you know, smooth seas uh, don't make skillful sailors. So you have to be involved in some difficult cases and that's what makes you better. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I'll take questions now or, or later. Okay, do we have questions now? Anyone wants to speak up? Uh, there, there are some questions in, in the chat. So if you guys want to ask, uh, yeah. Salman, just... you are going to ask if you see the chat. Okay, I can ask some questions. There are a questions. few questions. Yeah, so what is the secret uh, for your meticulous um, hemostasis? What is the secret for meticulous hemostasis? Well, I think that in the first case, you don't want to, you shouldn't cause the bleeding. So you'll be very careful when you're cutting with the arachnoid. It's, uh, I suppose it's, uh, it's sort of, you know, um, it's basic microsurgery, isn't it? You make small cuts, careful cuts. If there's bleeding, you immediately stop the bipolar ring. Um, uh, and you've got to keep control of bleeding the whole time. You've got to understand where the blood supply is coming from. I, I don't know if I have any particular secrets beyond that, uh, but it's just being very careful as you, as, as you go along through the whole operation and, and stopping the bleeding as you go, control the whole time. Okay, Lydia is asking, what is the role of opening the optic canals there? Oh, I think that's key. So if you look at uh, one of the things that endoscopic surgery is better than, than open, it's, it's in visual outcomes for some of these tumors. And, and I think that's because people are not opening optic canals in open surgery. Uh, I think opening the canal early is helpful when you're, when you're you know, protecting the nerve and you're manipulating the tumor. So opening early, although in those cases I did not. Uh, but I think that's very helpful. I think in terms of long-term visual outcomes and, and getting patients better, and in a lot of juxtas and meningiomas, we see the visual fields improve post-op. Uh, and we think that's because of getting that tumor out of the optic canal. So you've got to open the fast ligament, and take a bit of bone, it just gives you a nice plane as well, actually, in that area, just to work backwards, uh, get tumor out. Okay. So critical of all just to in germs. Sure. There's a question from Hina that hyperostotic bone on the skull base meningiomas, if they're not invaded by tumor, would you still remove them? Absolutely. Uh, as far as possible, I always would, particularly in sphenoorbital meningiomas, you have to, because otherwise you can't get into the orbit. Uh, so always, always, uh, we, we take everything out. We go all the way to ovale, all the way to rotundum. You can't go beyond that. You're limited by the nerves. And the optal apex is difficult. You know, it's usually a bit of soft tissue residual, but otherwise, yeah, it's all going to come out. And how do you approach the lamina terminalis, uh, you know, uh, from the ACOM segment? Uh, do you mean sort of in terms of opening? So you go, you go yeah. between... Uh, do you mean in terms of lifting up the ACOM complex yeah. and going in that way, I presume? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
that's what I would do. Uh, I don't do it very often. Vlad, of course, is a very experienced vascular surgeon. Vlad, do you want to take a question on the opening of lamina terminalis? Uh, I used to be opening it in uh, all fresh separate hemorrhages. Not anymore. Not anymore. But uh, you, you get it from perioral easily in, an, in a little oblique way. But there's a good question there on a the chat uh, from Gibran Tariq. Is it possible okay. to visualize whether the total tumor excision has been achieved in the intracellular compartment through a perianal approach? Uh, definitely. So the question is, can you see whether you've got all of the tumor out for planum or tuberculum and all that? Oh, absolutely. I think the terrianal gives you a fantastic view for looking all the way down into the pituitary fossa. I mean, one of the problems with the supra, you know, eyebrow and supraorbital sometimes, and it sort of depends, I suppose, on, on, on the pathology, but it can be difficult to look down and you can use an endoscope, but actually in the terrianal, you just get a beautiful view, don't you? You get a beautiful view across to the opposite side. You can look down. Yeah, you, you, I mean, you know at the end, you know what the post-op scan is going to look like uh, at the end. Can I have two, two remarks of my own? Of course. Very keen to hear from you, Vlad. Yeah. What I appreciate most is that the, the perioral is a working horse, you know, most frequent craniotomy in uh, neurosurgery. So everyone must uh, learn that. What we have now that uh, I always ask my resident, do a perioral and then either with frontal or temporal deviation, you know, whatever you yeah. need more. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you really can access anything. And uh, mm. What's obvious and what you have said that uh, you actually do not need the uh, Aussie. It's an mm. uh, unnecessary destruction of the skull base, which really is, uh, doesn't give you an advantage. And the next remark is that what I enjoy most, that you said that in all these meningiomas uh, in the cell region, you are opening the optic canal. I believe that this is a maneuver which really is a must in a way. Thank you, Sanjeeva, for this. Yeah, thank you. Vlad, the more we have some webinars together, we seem to agree on everything. I also really like your enough lateral. I think that's correct. Yeah. Vlad. I completely agree with that. that. <laughs> okay, I, th I think the last question is, uh, what about uh, difference between free bone flap and osteoplastic bone flap? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't use osteoplastic. I, I think you, well, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I wouldn't use the osteoplastic bone flap because... Um, that makes it very hard then to disconnect the temporalis muscle and take it down and back. And that's key, isn't it? You want it down and you want the bulk out of the way so you can go down the sphenoid. And so if you've got it connected, that's actually very hard to do. Uh, I think it's about more, what's more important is protecting the muscles and not monopolizing, and keeping, understanding its nerve and blood supply and having that healthy and then coming over your bone flap very nicely to protect the, and, and you know, our infection rate is extremely low, our, our complication rate is, is low. So I think it's really about understanding that more than the osteoplastics. I don't think osteoplastics are necessary. I don't personally use it. The yeah, only others can comment. Okay, there are a couple of more questions, but I'm sure you can answer in the chat because we're running short of time. Okay. Professor Juma, would you like to introduce Shan and we'll get on with it? Yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, congratulations to Shia. Very nice, basic talk. Uh, and I'm sure it was very useful to our younger colleagues. So it's a pleasure to introduce Shan, uh, who's Associate Professor of Neurosurgery at MD Anderson. Uh, with a joint appointment in head and neck surgery. He graduated from John Hopkins University School of Medicine in, uh, in 2006, and then went on to complete his residency in neurosurgery say, in the same institution in 2013. Following uh, graduation, he uh, has done two uh, skull-based fellowships. The first one was in MD Anderson, where his mentor was the extremely well-known uh, Franco de Monte. And then he went to Cornell in New York and worked with uh, uh, Ted Schwartz, uh, who we all know is a very accomplished endoscopist, neuroendoscopist. He has over 80 uh, peer review publications, 20 book chapters, and most of the work these days that you see is on uh, managing skull based tumors, malignant uh, or benign, uh, with all the uh, techniques that we have. And in the last two years, he's been nominated as the Texas Rising Star Super Doctor for two years in a row. So that's uh, uh, quite an uh, achievement. You must be very popular down in Texas. And uh, this year, he's received the Sir Charles Balance Award in Skull Based Surgery from the British uh, Skull Based uh, Society. And today, he's going to talk to us about his experience with the approach to 
uh, that hinterland between neurosurgery and head and neck surgery, the intertemporal fossa. So, Sean. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Juma, for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, let me just share the screen here. Are you all able to see my presentation? Okay. Okay. And uh, Dr. Shree, thank you for including me in this session. It's an honor to be included. And Sanjeev, a beautiful talk on the uh, terional definitely helped me appreciate, you know, really what is a, a work for a workhorse for neurosurgery. Uh, so I'm going to uh, shift the focus uh, from the paracel region down to the infratemporal fossa. And uh, admittedly, when I was going through my neurosurgery training, I really did not pay attention to the space below the middle cranial fossa floor. And after I finished my skull base fellowship, uh, you know, two weeks after starting as an attending, uh, I got a call from one of my head and neck surgery colleagues about this specific patient, uh, a young gentleman with an extensive uh, carcinoma involving the intracranial space, the middle fossa, and the uh, the infratemporal fossa here. Sorry, Sean, can you please uh, make this full screen? Yeah, let me do that here. One second here, let me try this. Great. Okay, is that full screen now? Yes, it is. Okay. And so, you know, two weeks after starting, I had received a call about this patient with this uh, extensive cancer involving the intracranial space, the middle fossa, temporal bone, and this disease extending into the infratemporal fossa. And you can see the carotid artery displaced medially and the mandible uh, displaced laterally here. And you know, ever since this case, I've uh, sort of developed an appreciation for infratemporal fossa surgery. And uh, you know, over the years, I guess, have learned some uh, very painful lessons, I guess, in terms of how to design a surgical strategy and, and achieve margins in this space. And so I think it's worthwhile for neurosurgeons to understand how to approach complex tumors in this area. Sort of stepping a little bit back in terms of the overall management of extensive skull base malignancies, you know, as neurosurgeons, we typically think of the skull base as in the anterior, middle, and posterior fossa. Uh, I think for malignancies and complex benign tumors, it's worthwhile to think of the skull base in terms of different zones. And this reflects the fact that these tumors simultaneously involve the intracranial space, the bony skull base, and the subcranial space. And each one of these zones actually has unique surgical challenges in terms of how do you access the area, how do you achieve a gross total resection or negative margins, and how do you reconstruct the skull base. And uh, zone two really refers to the space that extends from the mid pupillary line of the orbit, going back down to the uh, external auditory canal. And that includes the infratemporal fossa and also the anterolateral skull base. And certainly when we think about skull base cancers, most people commonly think about cyanonasal cancers involving the anterior skull base. Uh, but when we look at our own surgical practice at MD Anderson, uh, there's an equal representation of anterolateral skull base malignancies and infratemporal fossa uh, malignancies. And so certainly an important space to understand. You know, beyond the surgical challenges that are unique to each region, uh, there are different outcomes. And when the University of Toronto group looked at their outcomes for different malignancies by anatomic location, those specifically involving the anterolateral skull base had the poorest survival outcomes. And so I think this highlights the, the unique challenges uh, of managing pathology within with the infratemporal fossa and also highlights the, the different biology of the tumors that we see here. So for example, you know, certainly in the cyanonasal cavity, the most common cancers that we see are epithelial cancers where there are effective chemotherapy agents that play a big role in improving outcomes. Uh, in the anterolateral skull base and infratemporal fossa, the most common cancers that we see are primarily the bony and soft tissue sarcomas, uh, which are really relative to the carcinomas have poorer outcomes. And the, in terms of the bony sarcomas that we typically see in our practice extending into the infratemporal fossa, that commonly includes, for example, chondrosarcomas, osteosarcomas, and chordomas that arise from the clivus going into this space. And then we do see a healthy mix of carcinomas that either are skin cancers that secondarily invade into the infratemporal fossa or salivary gland cancers such as parotid uh, gland malignancies that extend into the infratemporal fossa. And while a lot of these malignancies don't exist within the neurosurgical space, as a neurosurgeon, if you're going to delve into this area, 
uh, you do have to understand the, the biology and the treatments of each one of these different types of cancers uh, in order to design an effective surgery. And certainly in terms of uh, benign pathology, the usual suspects are involved the infratemporal fossa in our practice, meningiomas, trigeminal schwannomas, and of course, JNAs. Uh, and so in terms of uh, designing a surgery for a malignancy, whether it's in the infratemporal fossa or in the central skull base, the goals of surgery are the same. And each one of these goals of surgery listed here are equally important. With regards to achieving negative margins, we've looked at our own practice and the ability to get negative margins has a significant impact on long-term survival for patients. And so with these extensive operations, you can achieve 10 to 12 year survival, which is extremely impactful in comparison to some of the other cancers that we treat as neurosurgeons. Equally important to actually removing the entire cancer is protecting critical neurovascular structures, performing a re adequate reconstruction and as I'll highlight to you, uh, is achieving optimal aesthetic outcomes. These patients live 10 to 12 years after surgery and they are undergoing major operations. So the reconstruction that provides optimal cosmesis is equally important. Now, in terms of reconstruction within the infratemporal fossa, uh, certainly and generally in skull-based surgery, we view that the primary goal of reconstruction is to prevent a CSF leak. And as a result, we primarily rely on rotational flaps such as temporalis flaps or pericranial flaps. When we start talking about extensive anterior lateral skull base resection, such as this fish C resection, where the temporal bone has been resected, you have the infratemporal fossa resected, the mandible has been resected, you have large segments of the carotid artery, the jugular bulb and lower cranial nerves exposed, the reconstruction goals here are very different. Beyond provide, beyond presenting, uh, pr uh, uh, preventing a CSF leak, you have a large volume defect that you need to reconstruct, and you have a defect that is clearly visible to the patient. So you got to reconstruct this in a way such that they're happy with regards to their quality of life outcomes. And so I'm going to touch more on this later on in the talk. And as I'll highlight to you in terms of the anatomy within the infratemporal fossa, there are a lot of crit critical neural and muscular structures that sit within the infratemporal fossa and surround the space that are ultimately manipulated surgically. And so when we look at patients that present to our practice, 80% of them have high symptom burden. These are patients that present with multiple cranial neuropathies that affect their quality of life. These are patients who present with trismus, uh, inability to open their jaw because of involvement of the pterygoid muscles. These are patients who present with swallowing difficulty. And so just as important as executing surgery and making sure the patient recovers well is having an understanding of what additional therapies that patient may need after surgery to help them get back to an ability to take care of themselves and be able to get back to work and take care of their family. And so I'll touch on that too. And so really I'm gonna focus uh, the rest of my talk on discussing some of the anatomic concepts uh, relevant to infratemporal fossa surgery, go over sort of uh, the usual slate of surgical strategies and how do you select amongst the different surgeries that are available, uh, share some of our outcomes and also our quality of life outcomes from our patient population and sort of highlighting how people do in the long run. So if you view the uh, infratemporal fossa as a room, the, this essentially sits right below the middle cranial fossa floor. And so the roof of that room is the middle cranial fossa floor. The lateral wall of the infratemporal fossa is the mandible. The medial wall is the lateral pterygoid plate. The floor of the infratemporal fossa is the medial pterygoid muscle that extends from the pterygoid plates down to the angle of the mandible. The back wall of the infratemporal fossa is really the temporal bone, the eustachian tube, and the stylopharyngeal fascia. And so I'm going to highlight some of these structures also. Now, in terms of the contents of the infratemporal fossa, there's certainly uh, cranial nerves, muscular structures, and vascular structures that you have to keep in mind. In terms of the vascular structures, the pterygoid venous plexus, which of course represents this communication between the intracranial venous system and the extracranial venous system, runs through foramen of valley. You have distal branches, the internal maxillary artery that course through the infratemporal fossa. And as I'll show you later on, the uh, upper cervical and parapharyngeal carotid arteries sit right behind the infratemporal fossa, and you have to have an understanding of that. In terms of muscular structures, you have the lateral medial pterygoid muscles. So the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle is adherent to the floor of the middle fossa. And on this axial view on the right here, uh, you can see the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle that runs back and attaches to the mandibular condyle. 
The temporalis muscle accounts for like the lateral 30% of the infratemporal fossa as it runs down underneath the zygomatic arch and connects into the mandible. There's an inferior head to the lateral pterygoid muscle that attaches to the lateral pterygoid plate and attaches to the mandible. And so these are important muscular structures to keep in mind. And then in terms of cranial nerves, uh, the mandibular division of uh, the trigeminal nerve go exits the foramen of valley and dumps straight down into the infratemporal fossa. And there's, as you heard earlier, an anterior and posterior division. And these run around the different heads of the lateral pterygoid muscles. Now I've included these uh, lateral views of the infratemporal fossa to highlight some key points. Now for reference, if you look at this image on the left here, uh, to the left side of that image, you can see the lateral orbital rim. Uh, in this case, the, the parotid gland, the facial nerve, and the mandible has been removed. The zygomatic arch has been removed also, and you can see the pterygoid muscles within the infratemporal fossa. But this image highlights some key points on the left side here is that, first of all, when you look at the mandibular condyle, the glenoid fossa and the temporomandibular joint, from a lateral view, this condyle blocks access to the posterior most aspect of the infratemporal fossa. And so this is why when you read papers on the subtemporal infratemporal fossa approach, there is a discussion about what to do with the mandible and the mandibular joint, because ultimately you have to uh, either mobilize it or resect it in order to get along the posterior aspect of the infratemporal fossa. I, another key point with the images here, especially the one on the right, is that it highlights the relationship of V2 as it exits the skull base and dumps into the pterygopalatine fossa. Often with these large infratemporal fossa tumors, these tumors also extend into the pterygopalatine fossa. And so having an understanding of the relationship of V2 as it exits the skull base and its branching pattern is important. And then both the pterygopalatine fossa and the infratemporal fossa communicate with the orbit via the inferior orbital fissure. And so studying that preoperative imaging to understand if there's tumor extension into the orbit is um, important. Now, discussing a little bit more about the posterior boundaries of the infratemporal fossa, uh, the stylopharyngeal fascia is a structure that I really had no idea about when I was going through my neurosurgery training. And uh, what the stylopharyngeal fascia is, is that it, laterally it starts out at the digastric muscle, it attaches to the styloid process and the styloid muscle, and then continues medially and blends into the pharyngeal basilar fascia. And the reason why this is a key structure to understand is that when you're dissecting or removing the infratemporal fossa, this is an avascular surgical plane where the back wall of the infratemporal fossa can be removed pretty efficiently uh, in a relatively uh, atraumatic a a way. The other reason why this fascial plane is important is because behind it sits the parapharyngeal carotid artery, the lower cranial nerves as they exit the skull base and the internal jugular vein. And on this image here on the right side, this is a lateral view of the parapharyngeal space. You can see the external auditory canal uh, right here, the mastoid tip for reference, the mandible has been removed. And here's the parapharyngeal carotid artery as it enters up into the skull base. And here you can see the styloid process and the, here the styloid muscles have been transected and the fascia has been removed. But this gives you an idea of not only the density of critical neurovascular structures behind this fascial barrier, but also its relationship to the infratemporal fossa anterior to it. And certainly on preoperative imaging, I always study that fascial barrier very closely because that really dictates the risk of the operation to the patient with regards to lower cranial nerve function and whether or not those lower, lower cranial nerves need to be dissected out. Uh, another key part of understanding the anatomy in this region is really the eustachian tube. There, of course, is a, a bony and a cartilaginous portion to the eustachian tube. On this illustration here, this is a ventral view of the eustachian tube from one of our papers. Uh, this highlights that the cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube is adherent to the undersurface of the skull base and is adherent to the skull base in close proximity to foramen lacerum and the laceral segment of the carotid artery. Uh, in addition, the, the cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube sits just behind V3 as it exits the skull base. And if you, when we talk about ventral approaches to the infratemporal fossa, the medial and lateral pterygoid plates ultimately need to be resected in order to expose this area. Uh, but when we deal with large nasopharyngeal cancers that involve the skull base and involve the infratemporal fossa, often this area, the eustachian tube needs to be dissected out. Now I've included this cadaver image on the right side here, which is a view of the right-sided uh, mandibular condyle. And here essentially the middle fossa has been resected and Glasscox triangle has been resected to highlight, first of all, the close relationship of the mandibular condyle to the eustachian tube. 
and the uh, vertical and horizontal petrous carotid artery. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, with a lot of these infratemporal fossa surgeries, the mandible needs to be removed in order to have direct access to this entire area. And I'll show you some cases there. Now, from the intracranial perspective, there's some nuances with regards to the dural anatomy and the bony anatomy that need to be kept in mind. Certainly throughout most of the skull base, the uh, dura has two layers, a dura propia and the endosteal layer that are unified with exception of along the cranial nerve foramina. And when, the, uh, when V2 and V3 exit the skull base, they're enveloped in an endosteal layer, which you can see here uh, on the image on the left side with this translucent membrane over the cranial nerves. The reason why that's an important consideration is that with these large resections, ultimately the cavernous sinus and Meckel's cave have to be exposed. And so the two layers of the dura need to be split and dissected in order to have adequate margins more medially here. Now, the image on the right I've included is really to highlight the bony triangles in the middle fossa that you ultimately uh, end up working through. And uh, for infratemporal fossa pathology, uh, at the very least, you're going to drill out the anterolateral triangle, which sits between V2 and V3. Removing that part of the bony floor of the middle fossa allows you access to the anterior and medial most mass aspect of the infratemporal fossa. It also allows you to access the pterygoid plates from above. And then also with a lot of these tumors, Glasscox triangle has to be drilled out. And so that includes skeletonizing the carotid artery, often transecting the eustachian tube and mobilizing the, uh, the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. The reason why that maneuver is important along with removal of the glenoid fossa is again, that allows you to obtain a margin along the carotid artery. It also allows you to dissect the posterior aspect of the infratemporal fossa from a superior trajectory. Now, when you read the literature, there are, there's no shortage of surgical approaches that have been reported to the infratemporal fossa. And I think perhaps the most popular reported one is the fish C approach that was really based on temporal bone malignancies or tumors extending into the infratemporal fossa. But really the way I sort of think about selecting approaches is that you have your ventral approaches. The classic ventral approaches include the transfacial approaches such as the maxillary swing, transmandibular approach, the endoscopic endonasal approach is now part of that toolbox. Then you have your lateral approaches. And the way I think about lateral approaches to the infratemporal fossa, you have your post auricular approaches or the incisions behind the ear. And these are primarily your, your transpetrous approaches such as the fish C approach. And we primarily use these for temporal bone tumors extending into the infratemporal fossa. And then you have your preauricular approaches where the, the exposure is centered in front of the ear canal and this is what we primarily use for true infratemporal fossa and anterolateral skull based pathology. And this really can be modified uh, for a, a variety of reasons. And then lastly, you have your superior approaches. And I think these are the most familiar uh, to the neurosurgical group, really consisting of the orbitozygomatic and the subtemporal transzygomatic approach. And really the thought here is that this allows you to gain access to the infratemporal fossa by working through the floor of the middle fossa. Uh, the superior based approaches really, I, I think, are ineffective for cancers of the infratemporal fossa, but I primarily use these uh, for benign tumors such as trigeminal schwannomas extending down to the infratemporal fossa. And so, again, uh, worthwhile to have as part of your toolbox. And so, I'm going to go through some of these selected approaches, just highlighting the nuances and what they can be used for. Now, of course, when you have 10 or 12 uh, different uh, approaches, how do you select the right approach to use? And uh, the way I think about this is sort of, you know, looking at our own practice is, first of all, you look at the epicenter of the tumor. You have, first of all, the most common tumors that involve the infratemporal fossa are those that begin elsewhere and secondarily invade into the infratemporal fossa, such as a temporal bone tumor or a skin cancer extending into that, uh, the infratemporal fossa. For those cases, the epicenter of the tumor is going to dictate what approach I use. Otherwise, for primary infratemporal fossa tumors, you can see on the right side with this uh, bar graph is that there are numerous anatomic extensions. So it can be confusing in terms of how do you factor this in, in terms of do I use a ventral or a lateral approach? What I simply look at is, is there temporal bone involvement and what's the degree of intradural or cavernous sinus invasion? And those are gonna dictate if I'm gonna do a ventral approach or a lateral approach to this space. So this is an example of a uh, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma arising from the temporal mandibular joint. And here there's involvement of the temporal bone structures. And so this is a great case to use a pre-auricular subtemporal infratemporal fossa approach. 
And here are the key steps uh, for that uh, surgical approach. And ultimately, the sequence of these steps allow you to isolate the infratemporal fossa from the surrounding anatomic compartments. So the way to think about the skin incision is that the superior portion of the skin incision is what you would use for a terional craniotomy. The inferior portion is called a modified glare incision. This is what the head and neck surgeons use for a parotidectomy. This scalp flap is raised above the parotid gland. And then what happens next is that, especially with this temporal bone involved and some degree of temporal bone resection is performed. This isolates the posterior wall of the infratemporal fossa. After that's done, the mandibular condyle is then removed. That again, provides direct access laterally to it. And then the intracranial dissection really involves drilling out the middle cranial fossa floor, both the anterior lateral triangles and Glasscox triangle uh, to isolate the superior portion, the medial portion of the infratemporal fossa and the anterior portion. And so we're stepping back here, the neck dissection that's done earlier on ultimately isolates the inferior portion of the infratemporal fossa because the pterygoid muscles and the temporalis muscles are detached from below and that frees up the floor of the infratemporal fossa. Now, for, with regards to the, the craniotomy that's needed, sort of, uh, as you heard earlier, the, the, the terrional craniotomy provides great access to the, the paracellar space and in selected situations can be modified uh, with an orbitozygomatic osteotomy. Now, specifically for infratemporal fossa pathology, usually the craniotomy is relatively small and you really rely more on providing, using the osteotomies. And in these cases, you don't necessarily have to do the full orbitozygomatic uh, the way I think about it is that I'm either going to do a zygomatic arch, oste arch osteotomy, and for selected cases, I'll add on an orbital osteotomy. In these infratemporal fossa tumors, performing the zygomatic arch osteotomy alone allows you to get that bulk of the temporalis muscle out of the way as you access the infratemporal fossa and really minimizes manipulation of the temporal lobe as you try to get more medial into the infratemporal fossa. And that used to be a big source of morbidity with these lateral approaches to the uh, ITF. So again, it's worthwhile to have an understanding of how to do a zygomatic arch osteotomy in these cases. So here's an intraoperative view from that uh, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma that I showed you. On the image on the right here, what you see is that the uh, lateral temporal bone structures have been removed. The black line highlights the course of the facial nerve as it courses into the parotid gland. The parotid gland has been reflected anteriorly with the skin flap. The ascending ramus and the uh, mandibular condyle were removed because they were involved with tumor. The middle fossa has been resected. Here, the dura is exposed over the undersurface of the temporal lobe. And as I'll show you later on, the sphenoid sinus and the deep structures are exposed here. And here's a close up view. Uh, you can see uh, the parapharyngeal carotid artery exposed. You have the uh, mandible, the cut end of the mandible here, and then the free arrow that's not labeled is pointing towards the stylopharyngeal fascia. And that's that thin fascial barrier that again, protects all those critical vascular structures there. Uh, what's hard to appreciate is that the forceps here, the tips of the forceps are on the vertical petrous carotid artery that was skeletonized during the resection. And then this was uh, the dural reconstruction that I did at the end of the operation. Another closed up view here, here's the sphenoid sinus exposed from that lateral approach for uh, uh, relevance. There's a thin suture line on the eustachian tube. In this case here, we didn't have to resect the eustachian tube, just the anterior wall was removed. Having, a, having an understanding of where the eustachian tube sits because is important because from the neurosurgical standpoint, that's a barrier that you're gonna use, but also you have to make sure that you suture up that eustachian tube at the end to prevent a CSF leak into the nasal cavity. And then uh, just for reference, here's the uh, hypoglossal nerve coursing lateral to the carotid artery. Uh, towards the tongue muscles there. Now, reconstruction, of course, is a big part here. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're done with these big operations, you have a big defect such as this one here. And as I mentioned earlier, the goal of reconstruction here is not only to prevent a CSF leak. You not only need drill coverage, but you have to provide coverage for exposed segments of the carotid artery. Another big consideration here is that by the time you're done, you've exposed the paranasal sinuses, you've exposed the uh, the cheek, the oropharynx, you have multiple mucosal surfaces that have been exposed. Uh, for skin cancers, you often have a large skin defect. And then another key consideration with regards to reconstruction is that, especially with uh, the carcinomas and skin cancers, uh, 
uh, they can have perineural invasion of the facial nerve. And so for some patients who present with preoperative facial nerve weakness due to involvement from cancer, uh, ultimately the facial nerve is electively sacrificed in order to get a negative margin and to completely remove the tumor. So what that means though, is that with regards to reconstruction here, how to reconstruct the facial nerve is an important part of the surgical planning. Uh, for some patients, they're candidates for nerve grafting, where for example, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is taken to regraft the nerve. And a good majority of those patients actually experience return of function about six to nine months after surgery. And then there are some patients where they're not candidates for facial nerve reanimation. And so in these patients, we do static techniques such as placing a, a gold weight in the eyelid or doing temporalis fascial sling to help provide some sort of uh, cosmetic outcome considering that they're gonna wake up with facial nerve weakness. And so given these goals of reconstruction, you can see that simply rotating a temporalis muscle uh, will not solve this. And this is really where you need to partner up with a good plastic surgeon who can perform an effective free tissue transfer. And from the neurosurgical standpoint, it's important to understand these goals of reconstruction because these are the things that you have to communicate with your plastic surgeon so that you have a good uh, reconstructive outcome and cosmetic outcome. And in this specific patient and a majority of patients, we typically use an anterior lateral thigh flap. This is a flap that can be harvested simultaneously while we're working to remove the tumor. And so it really cuts down on the operative time where you know, usually within about eight to 10 hours, you're done completely with the entire operation and the patient's out of the operating room. And for reference for this mesenchymal chondrosarcoma that I showed you on the left here is a preoperative scan. On the right, here's a postoperative scan with the free tissue transfer placed into there. Uh, and here's a cosmetic outcome uh, four years uh, post-treatment. So again, uh, an effective approach to this area. Now, certainly from the neurosurgical standpoint, we often don't get involved uh, with the ventral approaches, but every once in a while I do use them in my practice. This is an example of a high-grade sarcoma that I treated a couple of years ago. And here there was no involvement of the uh, temporal bone and there was limited bony, bony involvement of the skull base. And so in this case, we did a maxillary swing. And what that involves is a transpatial incision, the anterior wall, the maxillary sinus, along with the medial wall and the hard palate are uh, swung out and their left pedicle to the overlying skin. And that pedicle is important because it maintains vascular supply to that flap during the course of the operation. Because one of the big concerns with these transpatial approaches is osteoradionecrosis of the facial structures and having poor cosmetic outcomes. And so here are the intraoperative views uh, from this case. You can see on the left, the anterior wall, the maxillary sinus and the palate have been swung out laterally and they're left attached to the overlying skin. And for reference here, the white dashed line is over the uh, parapharyngeal carotid artery and the vertical petrous carotid artery that I had exposed and drilled out from a ventral view. And so this provides you for reference how far back in the infratemporal fossa you can get with the ventral approach and with a uh, reasonable cosmetic outcome. Now you can imagine that when the maxillary sinus and the facial structures are not involved to swing out the maxillary sinus that exposes the patient to a lot of perhaps unnecessary morbidity that can be avoided. And this is really where the endoscopic, endonasal and transmaxillary approaches are playing an increasing role in the management of infratemporal fossa tumors. And so this is an example of a 27 year old that I treated a couple of years ago who had a multiply recurrent uh, chondrosarcoma arising from the petrol clival synchondrosis extending into the clivus, the infratemporal fossa and uh, certainly up into the cavernous sinus. And this patient had had four prior operations, all subtotal resections. And of course, because of the multiple prior operations, all the local flaps I would have used normally to reconstruct this patient were completely gone. And so when I was planning for this patient, what I felt was that there was no single surgical strategy that would allow me complete access uh, to the entire tumor. With purely a lateral open approach, I would have had a hard time drilling out the entire clivus. With purely an endoscopic approach, there would have been the challenge of how do you reconstruct this? And there was also disease within the uh, bony skull base of the middle fossa and the temporal bone that would have been difficult to reach endoscopically. And so this is really where I did a hybrid approach. Uh, what I did was I relied on an endoscopic transpterygoid approach uh, to drill out the clivus, the petroclival synchondrosis, resect the cavernous sinus disease, and then the subtemporal approach really to drill out the middle fossa and perform the reconstruction. So this is where I did a hybrid approach.
<clears throat> certainly uh, in terms of executing an endoscopic approach uh, to the infratemporal fossa, while you may rely on an ENT to provide that access from the neurosurgical standpoint, it's, it's important to understand what needs to be done in the nasal cavity in order to get that far out laterally within the skull base, way away from the midline. And ultimately, working endonasally, you're going to work through the medial wall of the maxillary sinus. And in order to get really far lateral, what needs to be done is essentially a medial maxillectomy. And so sequentially, the ethmoid sinus needs to be removed, the uh, middle turbinate is removed, the inferior turbinate is removed, the nasolacrimal duct is ultimately skeletonized, and if needed, the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus is open. And this shifts your, your endoscope and the fulcrum of your endoscope out laterally so that you can get all the way out to the temporal mandibular joint endoscopically. And so for this chondrosarcoma, here are the intraoperative images. And again, for reference, what's been done at this point by the time we got to the middle image is that I had drilled out the medial lateral pterygoid plates. I had skeletonized V2. I had skeletonized V3. And then here's the carotid artery within the skull base that has been completely skeletonized. And then in order to gain access to the petroclival synchondrosis, the cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube is detached from the undersurface of the uh, skull base. The muscular attachments of the cartilaginous eustachian tube are transected. And then I transect it out laterally and essentially have drilled out the entire petroclival synchondrosis. The image on the right here, you can see the hypoglossal canal completely skeletonized. Below the hypoglossal canal, the occipital condyle partially drilled out. Um, but not in a way to destabilize the patient. And then after I did this, I then resected all the disease in the infratemporal fossa. And then here's the view from the right side of subtemporal approach I did for this patient. On the image on the left, the tip of the suction is on the superior orbital fissure. Here in the middle, you can see V2 extending into the pterygopalatine fossa, and then V3 extending into the infratemporal fossa. And if you look in the anterolateral triangle, you can see the large defect in the infratemporal fossa. This is hemostatic agent at the bottom. I had also drilled out Glasscox triangle. And what you don't see here is that uh, I had transposed a carotid artery posteriorly to provide additional access along the posterior aspect in the, of the infratemporal fossa. And then of course, reconstruction is important. You've got a big defect here. And so in order to reconstruct this, what we did is we took an anterolateral thigh flap and place that subtemporally to cover and reconstruct that entire defect. And again, I thought, you know, using, you know, the full spectrum of skull base really provided a good way uh, to really get the goals of surgery, but with much less morbidity in terms of taking out the mandible. Now, this is another case where I did a hybrid approach, and I've included this because this is a benign tumor. And I think this case highlights why if you understand the surgical approaches from malignant disease, you really very easily can tailor them for extensive benign tumors and tailor them in a way where you can really reduce morbidity. So this is a gentleman that had presented with proptosis, uh, diplopia, and trigeminal neuropathy to a, a local ENT. And uh, they went to biopsy the patient and they lost 600 cc's of blood when they did the transplenoidal uh, biopsy. And so I got a call from the operating room uh, when they were in the OR. And so I told them to pack it off the biopsy established the diagnosis of a cavernous hemangioma. And uh, when the patient was referred to me, I got an angiogram. And you can see that on the right here, there was external carotid and internal carotid artery supply to this tumor. And when I was looking at the MRI scan, especially when you look at the coronal view here, you can see that the tumor really envelops primarily the superior orbital fissure and V2 as it exits the skull base. There's a large component of this tumor medially within the sphenoid sinus that goes up to the planum. And then the part laterally involves the greater wing of the sphenoid and involves just the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle. And on the axial view here, you can see that it goes all the way back to the level of the carotid artery. And so when I looked at this, I thought that anatomically, uh, there are portions of this tumor that were better accessible via lateral approach and there are parts of this tumor that were accessible better via an endoscopic approach. And then a big part of the surgical planning was the blood supply for this tumor, especially the blood supply from the internal carotid artery could not be embolized. And so again, what I did here was a hybrid approach. I essentially uh, took all the disease medial uh, to the SOF and V2 endoscopically, and then the disease along the greater wing of the sphenoid and the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle resected that via a subtemporal approach. Now, a case like this, you're not left with a large defect. So putting the patient through a large free tissue transfer doesn't make sense. Uh, 
And in this case, of course, the blood supply is to the temporalis muscles preserved. And so that's a viable flap. And as uh, Sanjeeva had highlighted earlier on, there are three muscle bundles to the temporalis uh, muscle. And so in this case, I used two of those three muscles to really reconstruct the skull base defect and separate the intracranial space from the extracranial space. So again, this case highlights some of the, the importance of understanding both open and endoscopic approaches. Now, of course, it's uh, you know, one thing to just show individual cases, some of which, of course, are major operations, but how do people do in the long run? And I think that's an important part of the discussion. So you know, we've looked at our own experience, and what we see is that we're able to get a gross total resection in about 98% of patients, negative margins in about 65, 62% of patients. In terms of neurologic morbidity, there's no doubt that these surgical approaches are much more extensive than, for example, the management of midline central skull based malignancies. And certainly with the lateral approaches, the facial nerve is often dissected out, especially when the jugular foramen needs to be exposed. And about 15% of these patients often have either weakness related to dissection of the main trunk of the facial nerve or dissection of the distal branches of the facial nerve within the parotid gland. But a majority of those patients do get better when you look at them three months out and even longer six months out. And then for those patients who have tumor extension behind the stylopharyngeal fascia, there is an inherent risk uh, to lower cranial nerve deficits. Now, a lot of those patients already present with some degree of lower cranial nerve deficits preoperatively, and we usually don't add to that. But understanding this is important is because when we talk about postoperative performance status, there are things that need to be done. Beyond our ability to improve survival and remove the tumor and surgical complication rates, we've also looked at our experience in terms of quality of life outcomes. So, you know, are these patients able to take care of themselves? Are they able to get back to work and do all the things that they were enjoying before surgery? So in figure B here, uh, you know, this highlights sort of the Karnofsky performance score. And the Karnofsky performance score is a score that is a relatively quick and reproducible way that allows you to assess a patient's functional status. And in gray, you can see that a majority of the patients have a KPS of 80 or 90 before surgery. Uh, and when you look at them three months and 12 months postoperatively, most of them sort of stay at that level, but about 10 to 15% of patients actually do suffer with regards to quality of life in a delayed fashion after surgery. And so we've looked even in more detail in terms of which patients actually do better in terms of performance status and which patients do worse in terms of performance status. And what we know is that there is actually an interestingly a difference in terms of tumor biology. So patients with the sarcoma type cancers tend to do better after surgery in terms of recovery. They tend to do better in terms of their ability to get back to work and enjoy uh, the things that they were enjoying before surgery, as opposed to those patients that have carcinomas where they tend to do worse. And I think this has to do with the types of therapy we use in terms of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And I think the carcinomas, uh, these patients actually have much more cranial nerve involvement as opposed to the sarcomas. What also impacts functional status after surgery is swallowing function. And you know, we've talked about removing the pterygoid muscles. We've talked about dissecting the lower cranial nerves. So there are a lot of steps related to these operations that uh, can place swallowing function at risk. And those patients that actually suffer swallowing dysfunction and need a uh, feeding tube after surgery also do poorly afterwards. Interestingly, those patients who need an elective tracheostomy because it's involved in the airway, they do just fine after surgery when you when when look at their functional outcome. And that does not seem to impact their recovery at all. And then we've also looked at age. You know, you can certainly question that we're showing, you know, these big uh, eight to 12 hour operations with a five day hospital stay can the elderly tolerate this and do they recover? And what we find is that whether we're operating on a four-year-old or a 76-year-old, they all equally tolerate these operations just as well, as long as there aren't any contra um, major medical comorbidities. And that, that really is sort of the factor to consider. And also what we've noticed that when we look at these outcomes, they're independent of surgical approach. So there's no single surgical approach that provides better or worse outcomes. These outcomes are really related to the anatomic nature of these tumors and what parts have to be removed. And then really for the, uh, you know, the residents and fellows on, online right now, 
you know, of course, it's great to talk about surgical access and these great surgical cases. An equally important part of skull-based surgery, especially in this area, is managing all the symptoms before and after surgery. And uh, what you learn is that specifically with these anterolateral skull-based resections, there's a lot more to consider after surgery as opposed to the anterior skull-based resections. So, for example, with this atypical meningioma that's been previously radiated, this patient's presenting with swallowing dysfunction and trismus. So these patients, first of all, need to have their airway evaluated. They often have an inability to open their jaws. So intubating them during surgery may be difficult. They may need an electrotracheostomy. They may have poor dentition because they have longstanding trigeminal neuropathy. And so they, they really do not feel if they have any cavities. And so we often get a dental evaluation before and after surgery. We get a swallowing evaluation before and after surgery. Some of these patients already present with vocal cord paralysis. So do, doing a vocal cord injection can have tremendous positive impact on the recovery. Hearing rehabilitation, whether you're gonna resect the eustachian tube and cause a conductive hearing loss or resect the lateral temporal bone structures. And then of course, as I alluded to earlier on, facial nerve rehabilitation. So just as important as getting negative margins and doing a reconstruction, this is a, an important part of doing an effective surgery for these patients. So going back to this case that I showed you on the second slide of the talk, this was that patient that I treated early in my practice is neuroendocrine carcinoma. So what we did for this patient, uh, it was a fish C approach. The patient had a previous transmastoid incision. So we extended that above and below the neck. Here's the, on the third image here, you can see the intraoperative view, the retractors on the parotid gland, this fatty tissue here, the facial nerve going into it, the temporalis muscle reflected anteriorly. And of course you can see the neck dissection, the mandible, infratemporal fossa, middle fossa resected. And again, uh, the uh, post-operative scan with negative margins and a reconstruction at the end. <clears throat> so to wrap up here, uh, you know, I certainly have developed a tremendous respect for infratemporal fossa surgery. And while I've mainly presented malignancies, uh, with benign tumors, I see a lot of extensive sphenoorbital meningiomas or trigeminal schwannomas that have been subtly resected because the initial uh, operation that was done elsewhere before the patient was referred to me really didn't provide access to the infratemporal fossa. And so while you may not encounter this a lot in your practice, having an understanding of how to expose this area is important. And also I think having an understanding of the full spectrum of open and endoscopic approaches and uh, neurovascular anatomy is important. And then certainly the resection, the reconstruction strategies are really tailored to whether you're dealing with a malignant or benign disease. And I include the figure here on the left because certainly when we're talking about tumors, whether benign or malignant, as surgeons, it's important to not only be facile with all the approaches, but also understand where we fit with regards to chemo and radiation therapy. Because if you're gonna offer a surgery, you've gotta make sure that that patient recovers fast enough and well enough to actually go on to the next step. Otherwise, the surgery is meaningless. Uh, you know, once again, th thank you for including me in this session and I'm happy to take any questions. Tom, thank you so much. That was a terrific presentation and it's really a good indication of uh, uh, why it is that uh, uh, so many people go to MD Anderson uh, as the cancer center of last resort uh, because they have people like yourself who can get into a difficult area and salvage really impossible pathologies like the skull based uh, chondrosarcomas and, and, and chordomas and the sinonasal tumors that you talked about. So that's really terrific. I just want to uh, point to one question that's come up, and maybe you want to. In a few minutes, talking about a CSF uh, uh, management, so the leaks and how you prevent and how you treat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think just generally within the skull base, when you have these large defects, you know, the way I think about it is that, uh, you know, the way the human body is designed, there are several tissue layers that prevent uh, CSF from pouring into your nose. Uh, so you have the first tissue layer is arachnoid, second lit tissue layer is uh, the dura third tissue layer is the bone, and then the fourth tissue layer is either the mucosal lining of the nasal cavity or the muscular contest of the infratemporal fossa. So there are four tissue layers that prevent CSF and any person coming out of the nose. And when you're doing a big skull-based operation, uh, those four tissue layers need to be reconstructed. Uh, really, uh, I think one is meticulous closure of the dura. Uh, that's equally important as getting negative margins. Uh, another key part is vascularized closure. And I think early in this area, uh, especially with infratemporal fossa surgery, we used to rely on temporalis flaps. Uh, 
often when you're done at the end of the operation, the vascular supply to the temporalis muscle is questionable and maybe relatively avascular. And so I think there's a reason why in our own practice, uh, we've shifted towards the use of free flaps uh, because they're very robust flaps and the chances of them failing is, you know, 2%. Uh, I think those are key things. Now, there are also some patient specific factors uh, not specific to infratemporal fossil surgery, but skull-based surgery in general that you have to keep in mind. We know that patients that are morbidly obese generally live at higher intracranial pressures, and so they're at higher risk for a CSF leak after surgery. So those are patients perhaps where to consider the use of a spinal drain uh, after surgery to divert CSF to allow that reconstruction to close is important. Patients with obstructive sleep apnea also are at risk for postoperative CSF leaks. And so having a discussion of what to do uh, with their uh, obstructive sleep apnea management after surgery is also an important thing. But I think now, you know, the, when you look across the board, the CSF leak rates in skull-based surgery for large cancer resections like this hover around three to 5%. Uh, I think it's because of these improvements in reconstruction that have happened. Right, uh, Sean, can you just uh, switch off your, your screen? Uh, so let's have you back and then yeah. uh, Salman would like to take over. Right, I think uh, what we're gonna do is, uh, 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 yeah. Sanjeeva, you want to say, do you have any comments before we move, we move on? Uh, I have a couple of comments. First thing is I'm very glad that Sean and I both have the same Roton picture in our talks. <laughs> uh, so I'm very <laughs> I was very pleased to see that. Um, I think, uh, yeah, your strategy exactly mirrors what we do. So we interestingly also use an ALT flaps uh, for, for a lot of our reconstructions. We, we also uh, like the hybrid strategy for chordomas, chondrosarcs, malignancies in the combined endoscopic and open. So it, it was quite, it's very interesting listening to your talk and, and we're also very keen in, you know, on what, how fit they are to get through chemo and radiotherapy afterwards, otherwise, there's no point really in the operation and, and what their performance is uh, after. Uh, although your data seemed a lot better in terms of how you've collected the data, we've not been as good <laughs> uh, collected. That was very impressive. Um, but yeah, very nice talk, very very good data, and, and we agree fully with, with the with the approach. Uh, we we are very similar. We do in Oxford. Led. Uh, you are muted, Led. I'll just try to unmute you again. Yeah. Okay, Vlad. Yeah. Okay. No, that that was uh, excellent. This is something which is on the border of neurosurgery, and uh, uh, the few people who are able to do these uh, procedures are always to be applauded because they are uh, extraordinary for their patients. You know, and uh, the, the 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 approach you've shown, uh, Sean, was was uh, excellent. I enjoyed that very much. Thank you. Thanks. Brilliant. Um, thank you. I think we're just going to solve the multiple choice questions that we have and see uh, if uh, we are able to uh, transfer all that knowledge through. So let's go through the responses. If you go down all the way. No, no, we need to look at responses, not the questions, please. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, let's just go on to the responses directly. Okay, keep going. Yeah, that's it. Um, these questions belong to, um, I think, Sean, these questions belong to you? Yeah, absolutely. So do, do you want to take it from here? Yeah, sure. So uh, the first question was really regarding the location of the pterygoid venous plexus. And so the correct answer was uh, foramen ovale. Uh, you know, typically when you're dissecting along V3, along foramen ovale, that's when you, you run into the pterygoid venous plexus. So correct answer is uh, B. Okay, go so down. Can we go down? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sean? So uh, this was basically uh, pertaining to the stylopharyngeal fascia, and uh, you know, as I highlighted, there's a lot of critical vascular and neural structures that sit behind this. So really, the only uh, structure that does not course behind this fascia is the external carotid artery. That really runs sort of anterior and lateral to the uh, the fascia. Otherwise, everything else on that list. Uh, it sits behind the stylopharyngeal fascia. So the correct answer is the external carotid artery. Okay, brilliant. Okay. Uh, 
All right, relative to uh, the ventral approaches, subtemporal and pretemporal fossa approach uh, provides improved access to which anatomic compartment. So uh, what I would say is that uh, the temporal bone uh, is really what I was thinking about. Uh, and then next up, uh, you know, the uh, clivus uh, is actually a, one of the blind spots of the subtemporal infratemporal fossa approach. You really can get out to the lateral clivus, but if you're dealing with clival pathologies such as clival chordomas, uh, the subtemporal infratemporal fossa approach is in, inadequate. So that's why I had highlighted that when there's temporal bone involvement, that's where I always think about the subtemporal infratemporal fossa approach first. Okay. Let's go down. Right, okay. so this was, uh, you know, after a subtemporal infratemporal fossa approach uh, where a wide dural resection is performed and patient develops nasal drainage, what are the possible anatomic pathways by which CSF can get into the nasal cavity? So, um, Actually, all of these answers are, are correct. Uh, first of all, you know, by the time you're done with these resections, you're often exposed into the nasal cavity and the sinuses, and you're placing a free flap. And the, the free flap alone causes a seroma and drainage, right? And that's why plastic surgeons typically put drains. And so oftentimes I'll get calls from my residents or the fellows the first day after surgery saying there's bloody drainage from the nasal cavity. So not everything coming out of the nose after a big resection like this is CSF. And that's where, you know, doing the beta-2 transferrin and looking at the time course of the drainage is important. Otherwise, if there is a CSF leak, uh, then the eustachian tube is a source. That's why that's always needs to be sutured up and plugged up during surgery. The sphenoid sinus, if that was opened up, uh, can be a source in the max ray sinus. And again, understanding that allows you to do the reconstruction so each one of those sites is plugged up. So all of these answers are correct. Brilliant. Okay, next. All right, so this basically, this question goes to, uh, you know, uh, recovery and performance status after surgery. And, you know, as I showed you, uh, the outcomes really aren't related to surgical approach. Uh, I didn't discuss this, but it's not really related to the use of a surgical drain. It's not related to a tracheostomy. It's really swallowing function after surgery and the need for a percutaneous gastrostomy. That's the, uh, the correct answer to this question. That's very good. Um, have, have a look at the other MCQs. The, that's on. Okay. All right. That's fine. So um, we have the presenter's feedback. We'll quickly have a look at it. Usually we send it to you, but you know, can we go down? So um, majority are excellent and good. Uh, this is quality of evidence. Keep going. Content, excellent and good. Majority, yep. Keep going. Cool, thank you. Okay, and majority of the people would like to hear you again, which is excellent. Glad I'm not being fired. <laughs> Some didn't like you, but too much it's for okay. them. It's <laughs> okay. Neurosurgeons, neurosurgeons are used to that. So. <laughs> okay, that was brilliant. Really enjoyed that. Uh, Vlad, your last comments before we pack up? Again, you are muted, so. Hello. No, now it's OK. No, no, okay. it was, uh, today it was perfect. I really enjoyed myself very much. OK, brilliant. Uh, tomorrow, we have the IFNE World Federation of Neurosurgeon Endoscopy uh, weekend update, and it's number five tomorrow. And we're talking about ETVs. And uh, we have Kulkarni from Canada, uh, from Mexico. We have Tanakh and Shlomi um, from Israel. And we have Moody from Kenya and myself as moderators there. And that session is tomorrow at, uh, is it 6 o'clock again or 5 p.m.? So tomorrow at 5.
And on Sunday, we have the second um, uh, session of the module two, which is on cerebrum. So we're gonna be doing lobar and functional anatomy. So basically we are doing cerebrum here. And Pablo Gonzalez, uh, Azam, Hassan Sayed, and Chandrasekhar Dev Pajari are helping us. And everybody else is most welcome. Sanjeeva and Vlad, you know, it really was fun. And if you guys are there, we love it more because, you know, everybody has a small trick to tell and uh, we would love that. So it's, it's amazing. And I'd uh, request to all the um, trainees to please spread the word because this is amazing. I'm really, really learning loads from all these guys. And it's all wrote on um, neuroanatomy course that you're doing. So this is the second module, which will be finished on Thursday. And then we'll go on to the third module. Uh, so it was a pleasure having you all. Just by the way, on uh, next Wednesday, we have Franco Cerveri, who's the um, president of the World Federation. He would be joining us and he go he's going to give a presidential talk. Then we're going to have all the faculty that has given talks up till now. Um, to be given certificate and that, and uh, really appreciation from us and from all the trainees who have been listening to all these talks. So we are grateful to all of you. So Vled, uh, Sanjeeva, Shan, I'm grateful to all of you, like I'm sure everybody else is. So we're going to have this on Wednesday and you all are uh, required to be there. We'd love to, you to have to be there and you know, really want to uh, appreciate what you've done for us. And thank you thank very you. much. I really enjoyed thank it. Uh, very nice session. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and Sean, we're looking forward to having you again, uh, at least to start with as moderator and then another talk. And Sanjeev and Vlad, Vlad has given us three talks, so I'm sure we have got more to come from him. Happy to help in the future. Are you taking your group photo now? Your photo yeah, uh, Imad, is that group photo taken? Mm, yes, sir. I'm doing that. Can we all switch on our, our cameras, please? So we just get a group photograph and um, switch on your cameras, please, and smile. Done, brilliant. Yeah, one second. How yeah, many? It's done. It's done. Thank you. All, all five screens are done. Okay, you can put this on the, uh, the no, YouTube, other... you, put this on the YouTube page for everybody to see. Sure. All sure, right. Sir. Okay. Thank you, everybody. So we'll see you tomorrow at five. Thank you. Bye-bye.